Good morning, everyone, and welcome to part two of our financial literacy workshop. We are going to focus today on the psychology of spending and why we actually buy. I am Dr. Pamela Rivard Jones. I'm going to be your facilitator for today. I serve as the Assistant Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Baton Rouge, Parish of East Baton Rouge in the Office of Mayor President. And so today I am delighted to have a number of guests with us as we begin our second portion of our financial literacy series. So let's begin. So once again, welcome not only to those who are registered to be a part of our webinar, but also for those who are in our viewing audience on Facebook today. So the purpose of our workshop series is number one, to address a deeper dive into individual psychology and the psychological views, the attitudes, the beliefs, and the actions that are connected to our purchase behavior. Um, our audience is in for a treat because we're really going to talk about um, a deeper dive per se into why we actually make some of these purchase decisions. And I think this is going to be really um, insightful and also bring light to a lot of our purchasing decisions that we make. In addition to that, this workshop is going to have a general focus and it's going to address the impact of this emerging knowledge gap that we find many, even our youth and even adults that just don't have all of the, the background information when they're ready to make those purchase decisions. And even if it's a small purchase or if it's a larger purchase. The other um, area is we're gonna talk about the dependency upon payday loans. I think this is gonna be an intriguing conversation with some live testimonials. In addition, we'll address intergenerational poverty, societal pressures regarding finances, and really family background, which will be a major focus also. We're also going to discuss best practices towards eliminating debt and talking about negative financial habits. Um, this, of course, is something that I think these real life testimonials are going to help with because we're not only going to talk about the impacts, but we're also going to be very solution driven. So again, welcome to our audience. And now I would like to introduce to you all our mayor president, Mayor Sharon Weston Broom. Thank you so much for being with us again on this series. Mayor, we had nearly 25,000 uh, reaches in our first financial series in April. And here we are again with your support to bring to the Baton Rouge community our second series. So thank you for being with us today. And thank you, Dr. Jones, for the uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to our financial literacy uh, workshop today. And I really want to thank uh, Dr. Jones and her team. Uh, she has tirelessly uh, certainly been committed to the issues that empower our citizens, uh, whether it's education or financial literacy. Uh, she's certainly um, uh, worked to empower our community with information. And I greatly appreciate the work that she and her team have provided. And so our goal today is to provide our community financial education resources, as well as prepare for the long-term effects of the coronavirus pandemic. And as we move forward, financial literacy will continue to be critical for individuals and our small businesses. Today, we are discussing financial knowledge gaps, payday loans, intergenerational poverty, and the role societal pressures play on our finances. What we learn here today will be beneficial to all of us in examining and addressing the barriers that prevent us from reaching our financial goals. Our community is still financially recovering from the coronavirus pandemic. And many of us have experienced a shift in finances as a result. It's important for us not to only continuously assess our financial situations, but to discover how we can work to overcome the obstacles that limit our successes. And certainly my intention with this program is to help our community 
think, create and strategize new methods for um, money management. I will tell you when we first started dealing with the Corona uh, virus, COVID-19 pandemic, you know, I thought and I sat and talked to my team and I'm like, how are people going to make ends meet? How do you uh, financially survive in a COVID-19 environment? especially after workplaces were closed down. Uh, many people were even furloughed and laid off. So how do you navigate that? How do you keep you and your family intact? Or even if it's just you solo, how do you stay intact when the money is not coming in as usual? So that was our motivation for uh, doing these financial literacy seminars. And I do hope you have found them uh, beneficial. Uh, of course, this webinar builds on top of the six workshops that we've already done since April. And again, thank you for joining us today. And I hope to see all of you all again in our next workshop, which is on June 30th. And so with that being said, I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Uh, Pamela Jones. Dr. Jones? Um. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you again for your leadership. I can't even begin to tell you how impactful this has been for people in the Baton Rouge community. I hear so many positive comments about those who said, I just didn't know what to do before. And now we're giving information, a special thank you for bringing this to our department to be able to sponsor and to host. And also a special thank you to the partners who have just um, jump straight in to leverage their skills and to share um, much of what they do for the community. Today we have an incredible guest speaker that's with us today, Mary, along with our other partners. We're going to be joined by the Faith Fund, Mr. James Hunter, who is the executive, executive pardon me, director for the Faith Fund. We're also um, being joined by one of our returning partners, Ms. Janet Simmons, who is president and CEO for Hope Ministries. We also have two special guest speakers. As I mentioned to you, um, we're gonna have some testimonials. So Ms. Sydney Raby is an AmeriCorps VISTA in addition to you're fine. I just need like two to get through these next two slides and then I can come on there. We also have our office of mayor president, myself, Dr. Pamela Rivard Jones, and I again serve as an assistant chief administrative officer. So again, we look forward to being able to present this information to you all. Nearly 50% of Americans have expressed going into some form of debt or living from paycheck to paycheck as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, Mr. James Hunter is going to speak to us about this psychology of spending and what's been happening since stimulus checks and the unemployment checks have come out. But we're going to touch a little bit on the psyche of it. So he's going to share with us values versus attitudes. What's the difference between those? He's also going to talk about how do values and attitudes about money also influence the spending patterns we have. We're going to address the effect of social situations on spending. And then Mr. Hunter is going to talk about the positive piece of making a change in behavior. But first of all, let me tell you a little bit about who Mr. Hunter is. I had the privilege of speaking with him over the phone on numerous occasions and talking to him about the work that he does. As I mentioned, Mr. Hunter is an executive director of the Faith Fund. This is a nonprofit aimed at helping individuals and families better manage their money, escape predatory lending, and achieve financial stability. As a certified financial counselor, he understands that the road to financial independence is different for each individual. In order to bridge the financial well, divide, it's important that people meet wow. where they are on the financial journey. That you know, but if you really believe that, that by regular outlook out with the right assortment of financial products on the computer, then whenever you take ownership of their present situation and intelligently plan for their financial future. I love the quote that's here 
But in our flyer, Mr. James also gave a quote that I thought was so powerful. James stated that the journey to bridging the financial wealth divide begins with you. Your ability to evoke change involves a personal commitment to changing your behavior. The process is not easy, he said, but it's worth the sacrifice. In the words of James Baldwin, anyone who has ever struggled with poverty knows ex how extremely expensive it is to be poor. Mr. James Hunter, thank you for being with us today and thank you for the information you will share. I turn it over to you, sir. Um, Mr. Hunter, you're on mute, so I'm going to ask you to unmute for a sec. Hear me now? Yes, sir, we can. Thank you. Perfect. I said thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Uh, I want to first of all say thank you to you and also the, pres the, the president, Mayor Sharon Weston Broom for providing what I consider a platform for Baton Rouge to learn more about the importance of financial literacy. Before we begin to understand how we spend money, I think it's important that we understand our values and attitudes. So let's just dive in and ask, why are values and attitudes important? Values are strongly held beliefs that guide our behavior and reflect what we think is right or wrong. Unlike values, attitudes, on the other hand, are more flexible and they usually reflect our likes or dislikes. Now, values usually influence our attitudes and attitudes create an emotional reaction and the output of those is what we call behavior. Understanding our values and the resulting attitudes about money helps us understand our behavior. In other words, why we spend in a particular way. Our values about money are factors, and I'll name a few. Uh, first and foremost, family. Uh, the household in which you grew up in is the most important influence of how you view money. The way you mothers that put us there and that speak, even the brand we use are strongly in with numbers. is another vital role. America has a culture of spending. Even against the backdrop of COVID-19, when you turn on the radio or TV, all you hear is buy now, pay later. Another heavy hitter is the media. Movies, television shows, and videos full of images that depict the good life, I call it, uh, give us an idea of images that are kind of far from our reality. Nevertheless, these images influence how we judge our levels of success. And finally, attitudes and spending. Um, as I mentioned, uh, attitudes are more flexible than values. Instead of history, attitudes are more closely aligned with our daily experiences and current life situations. There are many triggers, and the key is to recognize your push buttons. And I feel that if we can do that, we can help change our behaviors. Uh, some of the most popular triggers that are out there are the power of advertising. That's, that's first and foremost something that's impacting us daily. Studies show that we receive about 200 to 500 advertisements a day and we process them. Uh, these ads come from TVs, radio pop-ups, uh, cell phones to the computers. And have you ever looked at the billboard on the highway? Yep, that was advertising. Even in the movies, companies pay millions to have their products strategically aligned for consumers to view. You know, I had to test the theory and my daughter, who's three years old, 
she's able to recognize brands. And believe it or not, I tell you, I got printouts of all the local logos that are out there. And without fail, she was able to recognize each and every one of them without words associated with them. She, in fact, was able to tell which one that she thought was better than the other. Those kind of influences come from our behaviors, our actions. Another trigger is my favorite. I call it the bandwagon effect. Uh, this is popular with trends or fads. And as more people become to believe in something, they automatic, automatically jump onto a bandwagon. Um, I'll never forget when I was growing up, I saw my first Michael Jackson video and it was rock with me. I went to my mother and said, I want my head to look just like Michael Jackson. I was on the bandwagon. Another one is buying stuff equals happiness. Have you ever noticed how happy, healthy people are when they're on a TV ad? Our minds are fixated on what we see. So we base our individual's worth based on our own stuff that we have or don't have. And another one that I call the last most powerful one is scarcity. It's a fear tactic that's out there that makes you believe that what you might lose on if the opportunity was to go away. Uh, we've all heard it many times. Hurry up while supplies last. Now for a limited time. And the most recent one, no more toilet tissue. This creates a sense of urgency in our brain that motivates us to purchase the item whether or not it is needed. Now we talked a little bit about the intro to the effects of social situations on spending, but I'm gonna dive into it a little bit more. Social situations can significantly affect our purchase behavior. Have you ever been out to dinner with a friend or found yourself debating with someone who's wanting to pay the bill? Depending on the situation and the social pressure we feel, we may decide to pay the bill or not pay the bill. 83% of Americans are more likely to buy from the people that they know. So therefore, peer pressure and a familiar face is another aspect that impacts social situations. This is companies like Tupperware and Pamper Chef rely on in-house parties to sell their products. Social class, another huge component. Have you ever come into a little bit of cash and all of a sudden wind up increasing your spending habits as well? Uh, many moons ago when I worked in a sales environment, I would get a quarterly bonus. And I'll never forget, I would call my, heart, my, my, my girl and say, sweetheart, don't throw out that meat. We going out tonight. That attitude was there where I wanted to spend what I had. Uh, atmosphere is another strong component and I'm going to end with that one. Have you ever been to an apartment store, a mall, and noticed how extremely difficult it was to exit? Uh, there's a reason behind that. See, the longer you're in the store, the greater the chance is that you're going to purchase something. Retailers control the lighting, the layout, the music, the temperature, and even the smell. Um, my first job out of college my boss told me, instruct your staff to pop popcorn every 30 minutes. I asked him why. He said, every a batch of popcorn, it costs us 50 cents. But for every bag of shopper buys, it's at $3. We make 500%. So sell the smell, son. I think that when you share personal experiences, it brings down barriers and allows others to empathize. Uh, for this next part of the webinar, I would like to welcome Sydney. She's going to share a personal narrative as it relates to financial wellness, and I ask that you simply listen. Welcome, Sydney. Please share your story. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and thank you, Mayor Brome, for inviting me on this webinar. Um, I would like to talk about my personal experience with payday loans. Um, my first experience with payday loans was in 2017. I was 19 years old. Um, I was helping an old friend out. Um, he needed help paying rent for his apartment. And 
at that time, I did not have the funds to be able to help him pay rent. He then introduced me to a payday loan company called Speedy Cash. Um, I went there, filled out the application, was approved, and I got the money right then and there. Um, I didn't realize it was going to be so easy to be able to get the money um, because I did not have any credit. Um, I had a steady income and it was just money right then and there in my hand. Um, then I began, began to realize when that time came to repay the loan, I was going to be missing $405 out of my check. And so then I reborrowed the money. So I paid what I was supposed to pay and then reborrowed that same amount, $350 back that second week. And I just realized I will only be losing $55 each paycheck. So I began, began to get into that habit of reborrowing every two weeks so I can consistently have that money into my bank account. Then I had to look for a car and I had extra bills coming in. So when it when the time came to repay the loan, I didn't have the money to pay it back. So then I seeked out other payday loan companies and I got into the habit of having multiple payday loan companies and just had, and it kept building up and building up and I realized I was in a hole. I then talked to my parents about it because I did not tell my parents that I had a payday loan, that I got into the cycle of payday loans. Um, they did not like it at all. Um, my mother and father said I should have talked to them about it because they know the cycles of payday loans. My father used to get payday loans when he were young, when he was younger. He helped me pay off a payday loan and he, they also talked to me about being able to um, get a payment plan on those payday loans to pay them down and never be able to get them again. So I got the payday loans on each of them and I had to set a standard of once I get those paid off, do not ever go back to them. And so they payday loans target youth my age because they're afraid to go to banks because we don't have credit or we don't have good credit. Um, and banks always, if you want a loan, if you need easy money, you have to have good credit. And that was a target for everyone because you see paid in loan companies everywhere. And it's very easy to get the money. And they email you, they call you and ask you, are you going to reborrow? Um, once I got rid of those pay loans, I realized they were in my emails. Are you going to reborrow? Want to reborrow? And so then I put those emails in my spam account so I wouldn't ever have to look at them again. So I have learned from my mistake and it's still learning from my mistake. And I would like everyone to grow from that. Thank you. Sydney, that is a very powerful story. And I thank you for sharing that. Um, I'll tell you one thing, uh, you're not alone. Payday loans don't discriminate on age, color, uh, marital status. They are very, very systematically designed to do what they do. Uh, the first question I have to ask you though is, uh, as you got into the one of doing a payday loan, were there any kind of incentives or ways in which they influenced you to take the pay loan out? So what they did with being able to get the payday loan, um, they said, once you sign up, you'll be able to get $50. So in my head, that's $53 that I can have in my pocket for just signing up to get this payday loan. And so I did. It, it was easy, like very, very easy money for me. Wow. And you examine the interest that you for the loans that you took out and the web that you got involved with. Uh, as you look at the fifty dollars now, you realize that what? I realized that could have been money in my pocket. Um, 
one thing I know that a lot of people do not do when they sign up for payday loans is read all those papers that they receive for the payday loan. Um, I never learned about interest on anything. I don't know what the 400% means to this day. And so a lot of people do not know that. And they'll just, the payday loan people, the employees will tell you to sign here, sign here, and you just sign. You don't even know what you're reading and you just get trapped. That's a very good word, trapped. After this call, I'll be more than happy to sit here to sit down with you and illustrate to you how those interest fees are calculated because even though you know better and can do better, it's not your responsibility to teach others and help them understand so they can avoid that same vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, the first word that comes to my mind when I listen to your story is predatory. And, you know, by, by definition, predatory means to seek out or oppress others. And, and, and with that, there's a whole industry built around exploiting or oppressing low to moderate income people. Um, did you know that one in four Louisiana residents rely on payday loans to meet ends meet, make ends meet? Yeah. Uh, in Baton Rouge alone, there's close to over 250,000 payday loans generated. Baton Rouge hosts one of the top three payday loans in the United States, as far as a market. And there are more alternative payday loans in Baton Rouge than there are McDonald's, Wendy's and Burger King combined. That's startling. But I empathize with you because I, I too, at one point in my life was caught up in a payday loan and it involves my time in college. I found that I was gonna be a dad and the first thing I wanted to do was get a reliable vehicle. It was my senior year and I thought, you know, I have to make some changes in my behavior. And I went to get my first car and believe it or not, the interest rate was 26%. I said, you want me to pay you a quarter for every dollar I borrow? Wow, something's wrong. But I didn't realize how important the credit was at the time. So with no less to turn, I said, you know what? Let's do the loan. I did it. Within the first month of me making my car note, my alternate went out. I was forced to go find another option to try to get help. I ended up going to a payday loan store. I got the loan like you did, just signed away and said, you know what, I need the money. Got to get my car fixed. That rate was very similar to what you're explaining, almost 400%. But at the same time, I took it. I went and talked to one of my coworkers and was just sharing my story about how frustrated I was about not having any money. And he told me about the local credit union that was in the area that I, I worked for. I worked for the university at the time, putting myself through school, and there was a credit union that represented us. So I was advised to go in there and believe it or not, they were able to help me go down the path of getting out of that loan, paying it off. And I vowed that I would never, <laughs> ever go back into a payday loan store. Uh, funny how the law of attraction works that I find myself now being an advocate against payday lenders, but the story is real. And when it hits you, it is nothing nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have never knew about credit unions being able to help with payday loans. That's, you have to, they don't teach that anywhere. Um, unless you look for it. Right. Which is all the reason why we're having this nice platform to yeah. openly discuss things like this, uh, which is a great segue into what I consider um, what I call my 10 ways to make a change in behavior. Uh, it's not an end all encompassing know all way, but based on my experiences, what I've seen and what I've worked with people I'm trying to overcome, these are viable alternatives that can help you get towards gaining or regaining your financial freedom. Mm -hmm. the warnings. Uh, so many times we ask ourselves, do I want that or do I need that? And we get ourselves confused about what's the difference. 
a basic need for survival, food, clothing, things like that, within reason is understandable. But there's no need to make the purchase that exceeds your lifestyle or puts you in a position where you got to go into debt. That's something you budget for. Uh, another one is to learn to pay yourself first. It's a personal preference, but I myself say that establish an amount that's comfortable for you, uh, 3%, 5%, 10%. Have that money automatically go into a savings account. If you can't start there, start with looking at your bills and finding out things that you're using that you can take away like the subscription to Hulu or the subscription to uh, Netflix. Take that money and put that to the side until you can have yourself enough money to pay yourself first, then afford that. Um, establishing a rainy day, rainy day fund. I think that what we've seen throughout this COVID-19 has been an eye-opening event to where we've seen what I call the upper class, the middle class, and the lower class turn into two classes because the middle class has truly found themselves in a position where they are struggling because they don't have that cushion fund that is needed to absorb events not as, you know, catastrophic as this but those that can set you back so i think that before you consider asking yourself can i purchase one of those wants that you add up every bill that you have and times that by six that is the goal that i would recommend that you would consider your rainy day fund another alternative is to be what i call an educated consumer it's, under, it's important to know what credit is. The power of credit is so important. If you know your purchase power, you know that if you pull your credit, that it's gonna hinder you a little bit. If you know that your debt to income ratio is a certain amount that you need it to be, uh, those are important things to know as a savvy person. Because we take the example of buying a car. If two people purchased a car at the same time, but had two different credit scores, based on their credit, the rate, and the amount of time that they have to pay it off, uh, some people can pay up to two times more what the car is worth as opposed to someone who's paying less than $1,000 more than the actual cost. But to get to that point, you have to be very educated about being a consumer. Next, I said, instead of using plastic, pay cash. It is so powerful to see the cash flow coming out of your hands if you're trying to stop the madness. We live in a plastic society so we can swipe our car for anything. McDonald's, uh, go to the movies, go anywhere you want, swipe your card. But when you have to pay cash for something, you get to see how much something truly costs, and that's eye-opening. Uh, live within your means. Uh, I, I say that honestly because we as individuals find ourselves wanting to have the latest and greatest things but we have to understand that in time, all those things are possible if you start with a plan and save. Understanding the power of advertising. I think that that is an unheard, unsung hero that we don't pay attention to. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a villain out there that we need to recognize. This is a billion dollar industry out there. They have one objective and that's to help people spend. That's, that's about it. And they have a team of individuals who work countless hours to make sure that we do that. Uh, they only concern with the end result, and that's your money. We can't get mad at them, but we have to understand that they're out there for that. Delayed gratification is another very important aspect. And that is a simple phrase that says, put off what you can have today for tomorrow for a greater return on your reward. It's important to say, if you want something bad enough, Maybe you can start contributing a, a fund towards buying it. Once you've established your rainy day fund, once you start paying yourself first, first, you can then say, you know what? You know, I would like to have that, but maybe not right now. I remember when I was in Chicago growing up, we had a, a store that I just, I love the aspect of it because you can go into that store and literally shop and they'll say to you, no pressure, but if you like it, you can put it on layaway with no money down. And we'll give you six months, no interest to pay it off. That right there was my delayed gratification because 
on a Sunday, I would go down there, look at stuff, take my five or ten dollars that I had that I could use and and put something towards it. Society doesn't work like that no more, but that's something that you can practice as a behavior at home. Uh, and last but not least, I think that it's important to celebrate success. Uh, this is a road that is not traveled by a lot, but for those that do travel it, find themselves to be in a very good financial situation and also in a very good situation when it comes down to time to purchase. It's an amazing feeling to go into a store or to go somewhere where you want something and know that you've done the right things to put yourself in a position to where you can give your social number and say, it's mine because I want it, because it's something that I can afford. Um, but those steps have to be celebrated and reinforced. So celebrate the small successes. Give yourself a pat on the back. Go to the movies. Treat yourself to a, a night out if you can after you reach the milestone. By doing those things, I think that you can start taking back and pecking away at those old behaviors and take control of your financial life. Um, I, I say this, that people call it a system. I call it conditioning. See, if you condition yourself, you can put everything you have into today and it can prepare you for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Um, I love that last piece where you talked about, don't call it a system, call it conditioning. And it does take time to be able to mobilize behaviors from um, negative habitual behaviors to actually positive and sustainable behaviors. And so I love the information that you shared and the top 10 ways that we can actually do that. Our next slide, and stick around, Mr. Hunter and Sydney. We're going to have questions at the end. So we'd like to have a healthy dialogue with each of you. Um, the next slide is an introduction of our next speaker. And so once again, I have the pleasure of partnering with Hope Ministries of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ms. Janet Simmons is the executive director. I want to just introduce a little bit uh, about Janet. Janet um, believes that running a nonprofit is no different than running a business. And her background in finance, in sales, and in marketing has proven to be important in her work as the president and CEO for Hope Ministries. Interestingly, Janet has a passion for impoverish and people and the desire to help people to move forward. Um, and that began at an early age. She was born and raised in Japan as the daughter of missionaries, and she credits her faith as a Christian as the motivating factor in her work. She's a member of South Baton Rouge Presbyterian Church is an on, and is on the music team. Janet served as president and CEO, which began in 2012, and her work continues. Janet, please share a little bit more about the incredible work that you do at Hope Ministries, and I welcome you and your special guests to our presentation. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and thanks to the mayor president uh, for being able to be in involved in this process in this webinar, which is so important. And James, thank you so much for your input. It was wonderful. And Sydney, thanks for sharing your story. Really appreciate that. Um, so we talked a little bit about the psychology of money and why we spend and what causes us to spend and how we make our decisions. And I wanted to share with you just some personal stories that I think reflect how we make decisions and how we um, it, decide what we're going to do. So when my husband and I got married, we saw things very differently. Even though we came from similar backgrounds, our financial decisions were based on what we learned growing up in our home. So my husband, for example, his father every two years would lease a car and he would drive the car for two years and then he would turn it in and lease another car every two years which is a very expensive way to own an automobile. But that was what he learned and that's what he did. Whereas I grew up owning, well, I didn't own it, my parents did, um, a used car that we ran to the ground. We would put 400,000 miles on a car at times. 
And so you can imagine when we came to a decision on purchasing a car and how we were going to make our decisions based on purchasing automobiles, we came from completely different backgrounds. And so we had to work through in our marriage to be able to work out how we were going to uh, decide on purchasing large items. And it ended up um, being a, an interesting process. And we had other things that also influenced influence this that way. One day I was talking to uh, one of one of my colleagues and we were talking about reducing debt with our household. And I'm a, a firm believer of not having a lot of debt. And this colleague of mine actually said, oh no, you need to let the bank carry your loan because you need to use their money. You need to free up your money. So the philosophy of, or the psychology of money and how we spend and how we buy is really influenced by how we grew up. My dad taught us that debt was not a good thing. And so that's how I learned growing up. Well, my colleague learned that you want to borrow money to use somebody else's money rather than your own. So it all depends on how you grew up. And I think that's the first thing to do to examine your spending habits is based on what you learned growing up. And whether or not those things that you learn, what we call learned behaviors, are good for you, are working for you, or are detrimental to your spending. Um, James, Mr. Hunter talked about this, about getting um, spending into an area where we, knew, we know what we're doing and not be influenced by those, influence, those people and um, things around us that cause us to make sometimes impulse decisions or social decisions based on what our influence is out. We call that changing your playgrounds and your playmates. Um, if you change your playgrounds and your playmates, then you can hopefully make some better decisions for yourself based on thought processes of how you're going to spend. One thing that I learned growing up was if you had an item that was a large item that you wanted to purchase, Wait for three days, then go back if you still really need it or want it, then make that purchase. That's another different tool that you can use because oftentimes what happens in three days, something else has come up and you realize, wow, I really don't need that item that I was wanting to get. So it's just like um, James talked about delayed gratification. I think that's really, really important. A couple of other things that came up as I was listening to um, the stories that were told, the learned behaviors of spending are also within your socioeconomic level. So I had a client that we were working with here at Hope Ministries who was working in a professional office and um, after, after work, oftentimes some of the engineers in her firm wanted to go out and get something to eat or drink afterwards. And so she, they asked her if she wanted to go and she said, sure, I'd love to go with you. And so she went, but she knew in her pocketbook, she only had $6. So she was very careful about how she ordered. She was very mindful of how much money she had. She ordered a Diet Coke or a Coke. And then when it came to split the bill, and James, you alluded to this earlier, what happened in a business office um, setting, oftentimes in the afternoon after work, if you go together to get a drink or have a meal, sometimes somebody will say, well, let's just split the bill. And that's a learned behavior of, of oftentimes professional uh, businesses and the people within those professional professions. Well, she did not understand that concept. That was not something she was aware of. And so she was panicked because all she had was $6 in her wallet. And so she was able to share that story with us and we were able to help her say, how would you have handled that differently in the future? And that would be maybe leave before everybody's finished and say, here's my $3 for my Coke or whatever it is so that you can get, stay out of those circumstances and issues where you're being peer pressured into doing something that you're not able to do. So that's just a, a common example that um, we've, we've come up. Um, one more thing um, that we 
we talked about earlier was the influence of the malls and not being able to get out of malls and whatnot. Casinos are very, very well managed by people who market their product by doing things like not having windows in the casino. So you never know what time of day it is. Those are the kinds of things that are influencing our decisions to make choices that we're not even aware of. So just be aware of all of those different things that um, influence us. We've got a lot more to talk about and discuss and also want to make sure that we have time to go to questions at the end. So I would like to now introduce to you all uh, one of my friends, Erlene Watts, who's here with me. And Erlene um, has been working with Hope Ministries for a while now. And she I would like for her to tell her story about her life and how um, her life has impacted her decisions in making financial decisions for herself and for her family. Erlene? Thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank um, Mayor President Broom, Dr. Jones, Mr. Hunter, and Cindy. Everything has been so awesome as far as what you've shared, and I can attest to that. Growing up, my mom, who was the only one that raised us, taught us early to, uh, to not only save, but to work for what we wanted because she couldn't afford everything for us. And so our grandparents used the sock system. And in the sock system, you put whatever you earned in that sock and you left it alone and you paid and utilized the rest of the money that you had for your bills. Well, that never left me. And then we went to the envelope system. And so I learned at an early age how important finances were and the values um, of that. And transitioning from being codependent and being in a relationship and then being on my own brought that aspect even more uh, to me. And so when you have young ones who see things that they want, you know, you, you have to have that word no you know, in your vocabulary. And so I had to learn to do that, which is not difficult at all, because now they're learning to save. But there are five words that I wanted to use today in, in conversating with. Um, the first one was vow, because I've learned that you're not above approach and that, you know, you need to be educated on the things and the information uh, that are out there. And Hope Ministries um, helped me to see a lot of the things I didn't I thought I knew, but I didn't know. And so when I went through the Going Beyond program, it taught, you know, not only to educate yourself, but setting up a system and a goal. And I love what Mr. Hunter put up on the board, having a smart goal. And so I learned that here, but I also learned it while attending school, you know, to be specific and to make sure what I wanted was measurable, you know, and attainable also. And so in learning that, I, um, got a, a broader perspective on, you know, how to manage my finances. I also had to see that um, I could believe that whatever was out there in my hands, I could utilize that. But I credit that to, to my relationship with Jesus. I just have to say that because I did not know how or where to be guided. You know, and, and like most of you out there, you may not uh, be familiar with the information that you need. So um, my mom taught me at an early age how to clean house, you know? And so being a mom by herself, you know, I realized that having um, my children that were depending on me and needing the income, what can I do? You know, and so when I was here at Hope, I had a staff member who told me, if you increase your clientele, you can be frugal with your time. And so in being frugal with my time, I started attending school again. And so increasing that taught me uh, the various things that I needed to do to implement um, what I needed to do better my, my finances. And the other thing was budgeting. That was, they were big on that, you know, um, basically spending the money where it needed to go and also saving. Now, I've learned to make my money over, and this is through uh, an author that I read, you know, of putting away at least a thousand dollars if you can save that for a rainy day, you know, and then um, spending, I guess, 80%, 20%, and then saving 80%. That was the rule. 
if I'm saying that right, you know? And so um, I learned to do that. And the last thing was realizing that um, you have a community, you have people that care. You know, you don't have to take huge steps. You take small and baby steps and then you can attain your goal, you know? And so I've learned through these workshops and being a part of this organization um, to understand the relationship between, as Mr. Hunter mentioned before, behavior and going beyond the barriers of lack into having enough. Thank you. Thank you, Erlene. We really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, so the next thing we want to talk about is when you're assessing the risks and rewards of your financial choices, do you consider the following? If I continue along this path, what is the short-term gain or the long-term impact? And one of the things that we've learned over time um, in working with um, people here at Hope Ministries is that a lot of times our clients don't have those SMART goals. They don't have those um, short or those long-term understanding of what my decisions I do, the things that I do today how are they going to influence my future? Because a lot of the people that we work with have been raised in generational poverty. And so they do have limited resources. And one of the, the limited resources is the thought of time. And time is of, of a immediate right now, what am I doing right now thought process rather than future direct. And so if you're only thinking about what's happening to you right now and you make all your decisions based on current, your current circumstances, then your decisions are gonna be different. You're not gonna make a decision based on how it's gonna impact you in the future. It's only going to be made about right now. A case in point, I had a client who um, got very similar to the payday loan um, at a rent to own television. And she got a rent to own television and she was paying $25 a week. That was a bargain. Um, and so she rented this television, which if you add the math up, it's $100 a month. She could have purchased that same television back in the day in three months, but instead she owed $25 a month, I mean a week for it. Well, the problem was she came up short one week and she didn't have the $25 to pay. And so what she did was she pawned the the TV. So now she has in the pawn shop a TV that she doesn't even own. And she was making her decisions based on what was happening to her right then. She wasn't making future uh, decisions based on future impact. Um, and the second thing is, does this financial choice help me and my family get to where we want to go? And Arlene alluded to that about helping her family and helping her children understand the value of spending and the, the difference between spending and saving and how important it is for her children to learn that so that they make wise decisions as they are um, moving into adulthood. And lastly, who in my life will be affected by my course of action and how? So is it gonna impact my children? Is it gonna impact my spouse? Is it gonna impact my colleagues or my friends? What are the things, how is it going to impact those people who I love around me? And those are the questions that are things that it would be helpful for you to think about when you're trying to decide whether or not you're going to spend something, particularly on a large item. But let me just add one more thing. Not just large items can take a lot of money out of your, your life. Even the small everyday items. And I have two quick stories to tell you about those. One is a colleague of mine who, after a year, balanced his um, his checking. Well, he was he was just checking to see what his spending habits had been over the year, and found that he was buying a diet coke at McDonald's every single day, which added up to over six hundred dollars for the year. Another is my sister who would go to Starbucks every morning. She and her husband would get a specialty coffee every morning. They didn't own a car. And they found that the money they were spending on Starbucks could be used for them to purchase a car if they just got a coffee pot and made coffee at home. 
So those are just two quick stories about how even small purchases can really impact your spending. And so it, it's really important to track your spending, see what you spend your, spend your uh, money on. And uh, one more quick story. We also had a client who, um, she did that. She tracked her spending for about a, a month and came back and talked to one of my colleagues. And she said, oh, wow, this is eye-opening. And he said, well, what happened? And she said, well, do you know I'm spending $300 a month on cigarettes? And he said, yeah. And she goes, no, you don't understand. I only smoke two cigarettes a day or less. And she was actually spending more on cigarettes because her boyfriend and her brother were buying cigarettes off, off of her. And so she was supporting their habit. All she had to do is quit let, allowing them to bump cigarettes off of her, and she reduced her bill by $250 a month. So things like that that you don't really think about, that you're spending, those are ways to really reduce how much you're spending on things and how you can reduce it. So um, having said that, there's a lot more to um, talk about, so I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Jones. Thank you, Janet, and also thank you to Ms. Watson. I mean, the conversations we're having today and just the candidness of, of real life experiences, I think will touch many of our viewers where they can identify with the examples that you provided, Janet, from the TV set to just the Diet Coke or even the Starbucks visits. At this time, I think it would be so important for us to have a richer dialogue where we begin to reflect on what you spoke of, Janet, which is this learning behavior of spending. And during this Q&A session, what I'd really like to do is, is pose a couple of questions to each of you. And, and let's just dialogue and talk about the impacts that we're seeing. Uh, what comes to mind, first of all, is who really impacted and influenced our purchase behaviors, how we learned about money management. And um, I love the example that you gave Ms. Watts about the sock system and then going to the envelope. Let's dialogue a little bit when we talk about our questions. Um, I'm gonna pose this to Mr. Hunter first. And the question is, when you were growing up in your family, who handled the finances? Mr. Hunter, and moving into today, because you're a father and you have your, your wife and your children, how is that being addressed now in your own family? So again, um, I'll pose that to both Janet and to Mr. Hunter. Janet, if you'd like, you could go first since you guys are still up on the screen. Thank you. Uh, so when I was growing up, my father pretty much handled all of the finances in our home. And um, but I learned a great deal from him about financial savvy and whatnot. And so I think I carried that forward. As I mentioned before, my husband and I had different philosophies about financial um, finance spending, financial attitudes, debt, all of those things. But we have now come to a more of an understanding. Both of us had to learn a whole lot. One of the things I did at a younger age was um, intern for one of my favorite financial advisors, Dave Ramsey. We lived in Nashville at the time, and before he became a famous financial advisor on the radio, um, I was one of his very young interns. And I learned a whole lot about debt reduction through him and through his processes. Um, and so as, as our family grew, we taught them a lot of things about financial stuff. Funny story, my daughter, when she was 16, decided she was ready to move out. So I put her on a, um, on a budget, how much rent she was going to pay, how much utility she was going to pay, her phone, all of those things. And she learned very quickly that she was not ready to move out of my house. And so it was just a method to teach kids um, how to spend their money. I know um, Mr. Hunter's stories. I love to hear his story. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hunter and let him talk about his story with his family. Perfect. Well, I have to say this. Everyone's story is very impactful to me because I think we all learn from socializations and experiences that we're all separate, but we're all together on some things. 
And in my household, I grew up in a, in a one parent household. My mom was the financial breadwinner and I learned all of my behaviors from her. Um, we talked about the sock method. I still have to be honest about what I consider a learned behavior that I practice to this day. And my mom, when she got paid, she would pay herself first. But you know how she would do that? She would get a money order and get it made payable to herself. Mm -hmm. And she would put that away. And every six months or whatever time it would take for that money order, the stale date, she would take all those and combine them into one. Her thought process behind that, as I think about it now, was that she was nervous about putting that money into an account because she didn't want it to be taken away, whether it be from some erroneous bill collector or something that she may have done wrong. You know, bad things happen to good people. My mother was one of those people that bad things happen to at times. I still do that to this day. And I firmly believe that that's a persistent poverty mindset. But in my situation, I've turned that into a best practice that I own. And I'm not afraid to say it, that I still have that money order mentality. I'll pay myself with money orders. It makes it so hard for me to get to it because it, it's something that I have to go through a process to cash and get through, get through, but it works out well. Now, in my household now, it's a family decision. Uh, we as a family get together and we talk about finances and we talk about goals and we talk about our checklist. So before anything is ever done, we ask ourselves, do we have enough money in the rainy day fund? Do we have it as a need or a want? Are we going to put money towards it? Or in some situations, do we walk away from it? But when it's all said and done, we stick together as one unit and we make a decision to move forward. Great. So another question that I wanted to bring up, and, and we have Sydney who represents our younger population. Sydney, what do you hear when you talk to friends in terms of the dialogue on money? Um, how do you all discuss that? And what are your friends' views on money? What, what can you share with us on that for the younger generation? We like to shop. <laughs> Actually, this morning, I talked to my best friend about JCPenney's closing, and they're having the 40% discount. And I was excited to hear about that. And that's what me and her like to do is shop. So we look for places that have discounts and Ross and uh, TJ Maxx and Marshalls. And we spend two, three hundred dollars at shopping. And that's how we look at money. Shopping. And then the other thing is food. Um, I love to spend my money on food. <laughs> um, I have a habit to where I do not eat leftovers at home. Uh, and so I eat a fresh meal every day, um, whether I buy something from lunch or I eat it at work or it's, I don't, I have not ever eaten leftovers. And the rest of my family, they do. I just don't at all. If I put it in the refrigerator from a restaurant, it's going to stay in the refrigerator until it's thrown away. Um, so I do know I spend a lot of money on food. Um, that's one of a lot, a lot of young people, a lot of people, bad habits is spending money on food. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I love the candor that you're bringing because this is real. This is your generation and you're just an example of it. I'm certain that not all youth do this, but, but there is a fact behind it. You have your money that's coming in. You may not have an abundance of bills that you have to pay at this time if you're staying with your parents. And so your money is going to a couple of different pockets, different buckets, and it's going towards your shopping and it's going towards your food. Um, but we also want to encourage you to put money away in savings and also making sure you have that preparation for a rainy day fund as Mr. Hunter and also the rest of our guest Janet was alluding to. I would love to hear Ms. Watts your input and advice. Having come through that generation, what advice would you give to Ms. Raby in terms of 
that spending pattern and how her friends talk about money. What do you think, Ms. Watts? Actually, Ms. Gravy, I give this to my teenage boys every week. <laughs> I have, um, they, I love the story that you said, if you put the food in the fridge, you don't eat it until it's time to throw it away. Where in our house, if I cook something that day, they're not gonna eat anything else until that is gone. <laughs> or they get it said, mom, where's the food? It's in there. It's in there from like the day before. So what I do is I try to encourage them to realize that um, I don't have the money to take them out, you know, and whatever they've earned, if they want to go out, that's extra. So that's something they're going to have to spend their money on because I'm already meeting the basic needs. And so I kind of remind them of that, but I have such good boys that um, one is very frugal. I mean, it's like he won't spend a dime unless you like really, really force it out of his pocket. The other one could care less. <laughs> and so there's a balance there. So I, if I could say anything with where I've come from is um, maximizing. And again, I like the delayed gratification. You know, if you if you have to have something, set it aside for yourself. But that's basically what I would um, I would say to Miss Gravy. And thanks for your transparency. <laughs> yes. You know, I also want to to touch on this whole psychology piece because again, when Mr. James first mentioned this to me. Um, I was so intrigued because I really do believe that there is there's so many influencers out there. And Mr. Hunter, I keep going back and forth, but Mr. James Hunter, you talked about when we first spoke about just this impactful influence. We even saw it during COVID when people started rushing to the stores to buy toilet paper. And you said that in your, your opening piece, there's no more no more tissue in the stores. And it's not that we were running out of it or that the manufacturers weren't making it. It's just that psychology of I need to hurry up and get to the store and make this purchase. I'd love to hear you and Janet's take on what's happened during this COVID-19 pandemic of how we've seen individual spending and maybe spending unnecessarily on things to even store up. So could you and Janet touch on that? Go ahead, Jerry. Sure. I would say that you're spot on with the fact that we have a marketing ploy that's out there that is triggered to even in the worst environments stimulate purchasing economy and you look at that in everything you do i alluded to it before but right now they call them COVID vehicles they got vehicles right now that they will offer you to purchase now no payments for six months um you turn on the radio you listen to the jewelry commercials it's the perfect time to get engaged no interest for five years right now it's about making purchases and building e-commerce um it's, it's, it's a sad situation, but it's a strategy that's out there and they have to do their job. And their job is to get us enticed. We have to make the distinguish between, again, is it a need or a want? I know that my habits to begin with are, I keep a nice uh, row of toilet tissue on, on hand, I do. But is it to the point where it stems me to go out and make a purchase of 12 dozen rolls and get into an argument? Uh, the same thing with the hurricane coming up. First thing I realized coming to the South is that the milk, cheese, and butter and bread is gone. <laughs> Why is that? Because we have been conditioned that scarcity is about to take place. And that scarcity tactic is something that's been taking place since the beginning of time. I have a little bit of a different take on this um, just from experiencing uh, the flood in 2016. And what we found after the flood in 2016 is not, a, not the same impact as the COVID-19 pandemic, but what we found was we had many, many people come to us after the flood because they purchased brand new vehicles because their vehicle was underwater. And we had clients that were coming to us that were paying 
$500 a month for a new vehicle and then add on top of that $400 a month in insurance or more. And their vehicle costs alone without counting for gasoline or any maintenance was almost $1,000 a month. And their income was less than $2,000 a month. And so just over half of that was um, on vehicles. And that's the same thing with regards to advertising these these companies get out there and they give, they entice you to purchase saying that, yeah, you can afford it. Sure, you can afford it. And the reality is you can't afford it. And so we found so many people underwater with their cars. And, you know, one of the things that um, a lot of people don't know is that when you buy a brand new car, when you roll it off the lot, it has depreciated by what, 25%, Mr. Hunter? Uh, you are very close to that. Uh it's definitely a walk-in depreciation. Yep. You're spot on with that. You're very spot on. Uh, one thing I think is important that we touched on earlier is that much more of a call to action for us to be educated consumers. Mm -hmm. You can advertise me to the sun is blue, but I know that I'm in my, in my zone and within my means. If I stay within those means, I'm not going to find myself in that predicament. Thank you both for that. I don't know if you all recall, there was a movie that came out entitled The Joneses. Now, I present that not because my name is Dr. Jones, but this movie was all about keeping up with the Joneses. It was about these stealth marketers who were um, who bought a beautiful home in a rich neighborhood, and the whole it was a comedy. But their whole purpose was to have um, the best new products and they continuously bought and bought and they showcased these products. And so it was all about making their neighbors jealous, but at the same time trying to get them to buy. It was such a marketing ploy. The movie reminds me of the type of societal pressures that we see today. And that's not just on young people, but it's on all adults, all people. And I wanted to, to get your take on that, especially in, in Sydney's case, because there is a peer pressure to have certain clothes that um, are the new fashions in style or the new gym shoes. And Sydney, can you talk about that and, and what that societal pressure, um, that impact is to, to your age group? Um. From my experience, what me, what I personally do, I'm not the one to try to follow everyone. Um, I am my own person. So shopping at expensive stores and spending a lot of money on expensive clothes is not the type of person I am. Um, I've never wanted to follow what everybody did. I'm a, I'm a very independent person. I like to do things on my own, on my own time by myself. Um, but the people around me while in high school and in college, um, they had to go to um, and spend expensive clothes, um, buy a wardrobe for, to go to a concert, or they just spent a lot of money um, going in line for checkers and spending money there. That's a, everybody's doing it. Like that's peer pressure because you see everybody else doing it. You're going to wait in that line. Um, just getting a PS5 or something, wait for that, spending a lot of money on new games and new shoes. Um, a lot of people do that. And they will talk about it on social media. And I was never the one to do that because that's the one thing I am weary about my money with spending a lot of money on clothes and shoes. That's something I've never did. Thank you for that. I also wanted to ask Ms. Watts, I know that you enjoy working a lot with the, the older population and Ms. Watts, with these stimulus checks that have come out and other things and just scams that have hit the communities, what advice would you give to our senior population as they're getting stimulus checks and, and how to really budget it and, and to manage the money that's coming into them? I know that a lot may not have um, someone to advocate for them. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say that would be a definite um, having someone to kind of watch over your finances or 
um, like we have the, you know, even a social worker at, at our agency who will check in on their client. Um, I just recently saw on the news where uh, an individual thought that um, what was being offered to them was really good and it was legitimate. You know, the advertisement was really professional and everything, but that person was taken. And so I would say advocacy, getting someone to help you with your finances. And if you don't have anyone, you know, maybe the primary caregiver, you know, if reliable, can help them with that. But uh, just be very cautious and careful, you know. Excellent. And I love the piece about getting someone to advocate for them. It's so important. I know I have my own mother. Um, when this when the telephone rings and you know that there are people telemarketers that are calling to really prey upon our senior citizens it's so important to educate them on best practices and what to be cautionary about including things that come in the mail to them and maybe ordering so uh, i love the work that you do and thank you for doing that as we draw a little bit to a close of our uh, webinar. What I'd like to do now is just to ask each of you to provide to our listening audience, to those on Facebook, if you would share your one action item that you're asking the community at large to really consider. What advice are you giving them in the action you would advise them to take, especially during this COVID-19 time frame? And I will ask Janet if you would start first. Mr. Hunter, and then we will go to Ms. Watts and then Sydney. Thank you. So my advice, make sure I'm unmuted. Yep. Um, my one advice uh, to the community right now is if you need help, we're here to help you. So Hope Ministries is available to provide financial literacy, one-on-one -on -one coaching. We also have a class that we teach that teaches a lot of these um, topics and a lot of the things that we've talked about today and we have these coaches that are very professional they've had financial backgrounds uh, retired bankers that work one-on-one -on -one with our clients to help them make the choices that they need to make and also to look at their budget and see whether or not they're doing the things that they need to do to get ahead and that's our goal is to move someone into um independence and self-sufficiency and moving forward to where your life is um, better than it has been. So if you're interested in um, contacting us, I know the information is going to be at the end of this video, um, but we're Hope Ministries in Baton Rouge and we're on Winburn Avenue. You can find us at www.hopebr.org. Uh, I'll take the next leg of that and say that, you know, when we look at the bigger picture, we have to face a lot of realities. Uh, I'm a person who loves to do research. When you look at the state of Louisiana in general, not just Baton Rouge, uh, we rank in the bottom to education, healthcare, crime, and opportunity overall for citizens. And to put on these opportunity webinars to educate and empower people is what I think is the most important thing we can do. Uh, we have to help people live their best financial life. And in order to do that and bridge the wealth divide that's in Louisiana, we have to not be afraid to share our narratives. And I think that when we do that, we liberate others to help them uh, feel better about themselves, but also it empowers others. And it allows us a chance to network and bring the sheet off of the the situation which is important to say that we have an issue that needs to be addressed. And when we do that, I think we can start changing the narrative and sharing stories of, of perseverance, uh, equity management, and financial empowerment. The Faith Fund is designed to meet people where they are in their financial journey. And in doing that, I think that we can by offering great financial counseling we partner with Hope Ministries. It's not about us competing. It's about we want to give people a hand up instead of a handout. And I'll end words that I heard eloquently quoted from James Baldwin. Anyone who's ever struggled with poverty knows how extremely expensive it is to be poor. 
It's time to change that. I guess I would say we've heard, we've heard a lot today and that's the start of it. The next part is to reach out, you know, don't be afraid. It's not too late to get the help and the information that's needed uh, because it's your decision. So I would encourage anyone that's listening today to, uh, to step out and to get the help that you need to start this, this journey. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, my first piece of advice is do not ever get a payday loan, um, <laughs> ever. Um, and my second piece of advice is when you are doing things like loans or credit, um, trying to get an apartment, um, especially young people um, or middle aged people trying to grow your life, um, this advice is seek help from the people that you consider mentors or your parents if you have a relationship with your parents or people like hope ministries and faith fund they'll be able to help and guide you to make the right decision on the next steps of your life excellent well you all have shared so much information i can tell you as as i say all the time i've been taking copious notes the whole time you've been talking and i just want to provide some reflection based off of what i've heard and as we delved into the whole psychology of spending that it's not just the sum stratum of when you go into the store as mr hunter alluded to it, it encompasses the attitudes, the behaviors, and even the family influences that we've seen. He also talked about this shrinking of a middle class that's happening now, specifically because we no longer have this cushion fund that's happening during COVID-19. We also talked and Mr. Uh, Hunter said, you have they teach you to sell the smell. It's all about a popcorn atmosphere. He also shared with us that we can't be afraid to share our narrative. And I think that's so powerful. Um, and this helps us, as he mentioned, to go away from the hand up to actually not having a hand out. And so we wanna make sure that individuals are being prepared. Um, he also mentioned about the rainy day fund. He mentioned about conditioning and not a system as he spoke about and understanding the power that advertising has over us. Um, Sydney even talked about the lack of knowledge in, in which alluded to these payday loans and um, how you can get trapped. And those were her words about, you know, avoiding the traps that exist. I also heard Ms. Janet discuss about evaluating your spending by how you were actually raised and to learn from the behaviors that you've seen before. She um, gave a clarion call of changing your playgrounds and changing your playmates. I love that piece. She also gave some strong advice, which I thought was wisdom. Wait for three days before making a purchase. And if it really is a need, you can always go back and make that purchase. So that's one I, I want everyone to remember. Wait for three days. That's our new rule. She also um, spoke in addition to Mr. Hunter about delayed gratification and gave this example of um, splitting the bill and how culture even plays a big part in our spending patterns. She discussed casinos and malls and the whole lore that they have by not even having windows sometimes, which gives us a chance to maybe break out and to go out. Um, I love what Ms. Watts gave in terms of the, the analogy behind the sock system and moving to an envelope system, saving for a rainy day. Um, Ms. Watts even told us we have to get a new vocabulary. She said we have to include the word no into our vocabulary. That means we have to go beyond what we see in front of us. Um, Mr. Hunter told us about his mom's story, the money order that she paid to herself. I love the analogy and encourage people to try that as a saving mechanism. Um, Sydney, you were talking about not eating leftovers, but I encourage all of our youth to begin to have their food um, money on a budget and to plan for those outings that they do as they go out. 
Um, we learned about COVID vehicles and the trap that's happening out there, um, especially now impacting some of these goals. Ms. Watts discussed about SMART goals and making sure that our goals are measurable when we talk about our finances. Janet alluded to short-term goals and long-term goals of financial planning. We discussed the rainy day of the $1,000, living by an 80-20 principle. All of these are Dave Ramsey uh, teaching tools that we've heard before. And then we also were told to start tracking our spending for one month just to pay attention to what we spend our money on and to see where those dollars are truly going. Are we spending on Diet Cokes? Are we actually spending it on money that can go into a savings account for a much larger and relevant purchase? All of this discussion, as rich as my notes are, and I know there, there's more to come, but all of this information will be available for our viewers on our website, brla.gov. We also will have the Facebook stream that's happening now available for viewers to go back and see, which I love. No shelf life. They can go back and watch it at any time. We also have a video that Hope Ministries has provided, and we're going to post that video on our website, the link to it, so that you all can view it. This has been such a rich discussion. I thank Mayor Broom again for her leadership and allowing us to do this. And I just have one final slide that I would like to present. These are our reminders. June 30th is part two, um, which is our second in the series, Bridging the Financial Divide. We're going to educate not only our internal employees within the city, but also our Baton Rouge community about the use of credit unions, big banks versus local credit unions. You can register for this webinar at brla.gov forward slash COVID workshop. I encourage everyone, if you're not familiar of the benefits that credit unions can provide, please join in and get the information. Once again, I want to say thank you to our presenters. As you see here, these are the logos of those that are partnering with us. If you want to view the webinar again, you can by going to the Facebook page, as I mentioned, or the City of Baton Rouge website. And again, please register. If you need support, uh, feel free to connect with Simone Paulette at simonepaulette at brla.gov, and she can help you to walk through that. Thank you all for viewing and thank you to our partners and to our special presenters for being with us today. Have a wonderful afternoon and remember the psychology of spending and why you're actually going to buy that next item. When you pick it up, ask yourself that question. Do I need this or do I just want it? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.